Well, we have already made an introduction to international criminal law. Um, in this class, I want to provide you with some details of the entire concepts and sources as well. And then we'll move to the um, functioning of international criminal court. What you're learning in this chapter as international criminal law is a part of universal jurisdiction. Do you know what it is? Have you ever heard of that concept, universal jurisdiction? You have heard of that. Under uh, what context you have encountered that? Do you remember what universal jurisdiction is? Actually, we'll come back to uh, that universal jurisdiction later in the course. What you have to keep in mind is that there are several offenses that are potentially subject to universal jurisdiction. The very famous case nowadays that we come across is the Somalian piracy case, right? Somalian pirates are committing their crimes in international waters. And well, either we have to wait until they go back to Somalian territorial waters and then Somalian uh, jurisdiction takes care of it. But on the other hand, what we know is that they are not going back to their territorial waters. They're not being captured by the jurisdiction of Somalia. They're committing their crimes in international waters. They're giving harm to the ships of all other nations. Universal jurisdiction is a doctrine of international law. And universal jurisdiction allows other states and international organizations to prosecute the criminals on their own. So the aim of universal jurisdiction is ending impunity. Fight against impunity is borderless. Wherever the crime is committed, then all other nations, all other states and international organizations have right to prosecute uh, on those crimes. The thing is that universal jurisdiction includes various crimes. They are known as transnational crimes and international crimes. Does anyone know the difference in between? Uh, international is uh, between uh, crimes done between nations, uh, a nation to another nation. But transnational is, uh, for example, uh, the example you gave is an example for transnational. This one wrong what you have said, and this one was close enough. So at the moment, what we know is that, for instance, terror is a crime. The thing is that terror used to be a national crime until 1990s. Each nation, well, nations were coming across with those problems. The thing is that uh, the terrorists were also nationals. At the moment, once we start talking about terror, what we know is that once there's a bombing in London, once there's a bombing in Paris, once there's a bombing in Istanbul, then what we know is that Probably, and for most of the time that's the case, the terrorists are coming from country A. They're trained in the state B or C, and then they commit their crimes in the third or fourth countries. So the terrorist is coming from one origin, being trained in another place, and the outcome of their crimes are uh, affecting third, fourth countries. That's a transnational crime. That's typical for now. Drugs trafficking. Well, they're planted in Afghanistan, carried through Iran and Turkey and carried into Europe and so on. That's a transnational crime. Money laundry is a transnational crime. Human trafficking is a transnational crime. Uh, intellectual property theft. That's happening all around the world at the moment. That's the basis of entire uh, conflict in between the United States and China. You know about the nature of that conflict, hopefully. 
well, uh, the hackers from China are stealing the entire ideas from Silicon Valley, from United States, and then they do their production over the uh, programs and applications and calculations they have stolen. They produce it for ch cheap for prices in China and they sell it back to the United States. And they're not paying any kind of intellectual property for the <coughs> US producers of those ideas, of those uh, applications, programs, and so on. So this is cyber crimes are transnational crimes. And they fall under universal jurisdiction. International criminal jurisdiction falls also under universal jurisdiction, but not through transnational crimes, but international crimes. International crimes are already defined by the Rome Statute, which is the founding treaty of International Criminal Court. Do you remember when the agreement was signed? The year? 98 is when the agreement is signed and the court was established in 2002. And there in the Rome Statute, we see that four international crimes, four core crimes are already defined, which are good. War crimes. Crimes against humanity and crime of, act of aggression are four core crimes, four international crimes. So universal jurisdiction deals with all those offenses and in, under international criminal law, what we concentrate on is international uh, crimes part. Definition of international crimes. We have already spoken about those four crimes and what they mean. And we know that Rome Statute is a very new paper, a very new treaty that was adopted in, uh, in 1998. And the court was established in 2002. They're so new and we know that such crimes were already committed in the former years. What we know is that although the source that I have just referred to is a new one, there are some other historical sources that we can also make references to. The earliest version is known as the one that was conducted in the aftermath of the First World War. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Which court, which tribunals? The Leipzig tribunals. Leipzig tribunals were established in the aftermath of the First World War, in order to prosecute the uh, perpetrators of war crimes. And then we come across with some other ad hoc courts. In the aftermath of the Second World War, in '45, we have seen that Nuremberg military tribunals were established in '45. Tokyo tribunals were established in 48, if I'm not mistaken, 46 or 48. They are also examples to universal jurisdiction. For Nuremberg military tribunals, judges were coming from all around the world, international judges. And they are there in order to prosecute the um, criminals of Holocaust. The thing is that, to which law book are they supposed to refer to? What is the basis of their prosecution? There's a huge gap, right? In order to fill that gap, let me find the slides, relevant slides. Those Committee of judges have decided to prepare, first of all, their own guidelines. Those guidelines are also known as Nuremberg Principles. And Nuremberg Principles set the entire basis of the Rome Statute that we're using at the moment. 
In addition to Nuremberg principles, you can also always refer to the Statute of the International Criminal Tribunal on the former Yugoslavia, but that's also relatively new. That was formulated in 1991. In Nuremberg uh, principles, their basic aim was establishing individual criminal responsibility. State responsibility is a chapter that we have already studied and we know that state responsibility is based upon customary law. So attribution of certain crimes to the state was already existing somehow. And here the crimes that we come across are grave violations of human rights. Human rights are for entire mankind. You agree, right? So for the entire homo sapiens, there is no discrimination. Human rights are even there for criminals. Human rights are even there for terrorists. Human rights are also there for those that are totally mentally disabled to perceive that they are human beings. So what does it mean? What I mean is that Terrorists are criminals and they kill innocent people. Still, this does not mean that if you capture a terrorist, you can torture, you can humiliate, you can uh, make them subject to ill behavior. Impossible, right? They still have that human honor. So the basic idea behind human rights is that all individuals, all homo sapiens represent the mankind. The honor of one individual is representing the honor of the entire mankind. Therefore, first of all, this honor has to be held up. This has to be protected and promoted. Secondly, there are some human beings that also commit crimes against human rights they still have right for a fair trial. So, they can also come before judge and they still have to be given the chance to express themselves and then they have to be punished according to laws, according to principles of national or international law. So, what we need is the principles. Here, uh, Nuremberg principles have set the basic guidelines in order how to uh, prosecute the criminals of Holocaust, of genocide crimes and war crimes and crimes against humanity and acts of aggression. The first idea was establishing the individual responsibility for all leaders and the members of the army as well. The first principle is telling us one thing. What we know is that those grave violations of human rights are products of uh, state policies. They're organized by the state. And the state policies are formulated by their own leaders. What they do is, if they decide to commit such grave uh, human rights violations, what they do is changing laws. Then national laws are becoming completely unable to prosecute them because what they are doing is completely legal under their own codification. According to Nuremberg principles, International law overrides national law. This is not how it's formulated. The sentence reads somehow else. The sentence says, any person who commits an act which constitutes a crime under international law is responsible and therefore liable to punishment. So if this person, the leader, has changed the laws, then what she or he is doing is not a crime, actually, according to national laws. And the first principle says, if the act 
is a crime. Under international law, the person will be held responsible for what uh, she or he has done and will be punished accordingly. This is the first thing. In the second principle, if they have changed the laws, this means national law, municipal law, is not implementing any kind of sanctions of those people. International criminal law or Nuremberg principles teaches us that when internal law does not implement any kind of penalty, but if the act is a crime according to international law, then the person is not relieved according to national law. The person is still responsible for their crime and will be punished accordingly. And the third principle is saying that being head of the state does not relieve the person from being punished. Why is that important? Being head of the state or being one of the leaders means being immune. They have their judicial immunities. Then those leaders cannot be tried before courts. National courts, actually all nations have their own criminal laws already. Criminal law is something quite domestic. And all criminal law, all states have their criminal laws. And the crimes are any kind of crimes that you can actually mention from murder to rape to plunder to robbery. That can be anything. The thing is that the leaders are still immune against their own criminal laws too. But if they are conducting one of the four core crimes, then it does not matter what internal laws foresee and what kind of legal immunities those people uh, enjoy normally. Once perpetration of uh, those crimes come to happen, then international criminal law steps in and those individuals will carry the responsibility of their acts. The fourth principle of <clears throat> Nuremberg principles is formulated for the lower ranks. Until now, we have mentioned the leaders the head of the state, the uh, top generals, commanders. Imagine you being one of the soldiers in a uh, Nazi army. You're one of the soldiers of Schutzstaffel. And then your commanders are telling you to follow certain orders, of course, like capturing Jews, carrying them to concentration camps seeing who is useless. If the person is useless, put this person into gas chamber. So, and what, as a soldier, what you're doing is following the orders, right? The fourth principle is telling that you cannot follow such orders if those orders are violating human rights. And if you're acting pursuant to the orders, then you individually have to know that you're going to carry the individual responsibility of those crimes. You become a criminal. You don't remain innocent. And you cannot um, defend yourself by saying that I was following the orders. If I was not following the orders, then I could be punished by my commander, by my general. If you are following the orders, then you have to know that you become a criminal according to international codes. And the fifth principle is there on behalf of the uh, on behalf of upholding the entire human rights that regardless of their crimes, whoever they are, they still have the right for a fair trial. So if you capture one of those criminals, then probably you're full of rage and you want to torture those people, humiliate those people and give harm to them, 
This is also not a kind of punishment. This is also a violation of human rights. If this person is a criminal, then this person has to be brought before the committee of judges and has to be tried according to standards, legal standards, like such principles and customs, whatever. So right to fair trial is also protected. Let me just finish the principles and then I'll collect the questions. Starting from the principle six, we see the early definitions of international crimes. Uh, Nuremberg principles have defined us what crimes against peace are. Crimes against peace are also known as act of aggression. Crime of aggression is crime against peace. Later, peace is also set as a principle by the UN Charter in 44. And crimes against peace are actually <coughs> crimes of starting war. Use of force is completely prohibited by international law. According to international law, well, there are accepted casus belli. When, what does belli mean? Belli bellum. That's war. Causes of war. So if territories of a state are somehow invaded, then this gives a casus belli. When the ambassador is killed, this is casus belli then. Or self-defense is complete access. Casus belli also uh, is given as a result of self-defense access. Once your territory is invaded, then you have to protect your uh, territorial integrity. Therefore, international law only lets self-defense taking place. What's happening under this title as a crime against peace is not covered here, it's not self-defense. We have given the example of Pearl Harbor in our last class. Pearl Harbor is an attack and there was no declaration of war in beforehand. So this was an act of aggression. States need certain reasons to start uh, actions against each other. Imagine there's state A and state B, and state A has some unacceptable uh, military goals in state B. And it needs some reason to attack. It cannot find any. What it does is it sends a couple of soldiers of its own to the other side of the border. And those soldiers start shooting some civilian targets. There's a city, village, whatever, back. And state A claims that we're shot by state B, therefore we declare war on them. This is a crime against peace. This is what is meant here by planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression. This is, here you come across with a plan, and then the war is waged, and this is actually not legitimate. Therefore, this is an act of aggression, and this is completely prohibited by international law. This is known as act of aggression, and the first time it was formulated was in Nuremberg Principles, principle number six. It's continued by defining what war crimes are and what crimes against humanity are. War is also strictly regulated by international law. Uh, war laws are mainly formulated under um, customary law. Interna customary international law gives us the basic source for the laws of war, how to wage war. First of all, a declaration is necessary. And then we have said the soldiers have to put on their uniforms because a war can only happen in between armies. 
in between soldiers. So in order to define if the person is a civilian or not, their uniforms are necessary. And they have to carry their weapons openly. They have their munitions open. They carry their weapons openly. And they never shoot at civilian targets unless there is a military necessary. How war is happening is that. Here is the state A once again and state B. And here we have villages or cities, so civilian targets. Like a city. And they have military bases here. Like they hold their planes here and they have their arsenal here. Then state B can start shooting military targets and state A, A as well. They cannot simply start killing civilians living in the cities. This is a war crime, for instance. Or if the soldiers of state A are starting to march in, where they can target is against military targets. They cannot simply enter into villages, kill people, plunder their goods, money, food, whatever. This is a war crime once again. War crimes are those acts that are committed by uh, soldiers of one state on the civilians of another state. Or if it's not civilians, soldiers can also conduct war crimes on soldiers of another state. When? This can happen if they are starting holding hostages, for instance. Holding so hostages, okay, and this can have a diplomatic necessity for negotiation, co negotiating conditions and giving them. While holding, uh, holding the hostages, those hostages cannot be humiliated. Ill treatment is impossible. Torture is impossible. So human rights will always be held up. Those hostages cannot be naked because this is humiliation. They have to be given something to put on. They have to be provided with at least minimum amount of food and beverages so that they survive. And they won't be tortured. They will be kept. Those are the laws of a war. And once they are uh, violated, then war crimes start to happen and they are punishable acts. Once we move to crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity include all kinds of crimes that you can think of. The thing is that crimes against humanity take place during peace times when no war is declared, and they're conducted by, for most of the time, let's say, civilians on civilians. Here, military personnel was under focus, and here, the civilians. And those crimes include anything that you can think of, from murder to extermination, or Persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds. What is persecution? Not prosecution, persecution. Normally, human rights violations are violations of human rights. And violations of human rights indicate as some kind of discrimination, of course. Then we have to discuss about the basis of discrimination. In the very beginning of our class, uh, we were discussing how genocide is conducted. And we know that a genocide never starts on uh, students of international relations and political science and law of Bilkent University. This is not a basis of discrimination generally, right? So what is the basis of discrimination? It has two important elements. Basis of discrimination is either on the features brought by birth, which is your 
ethnicity, for instance, your nationality, for instance. Religion is also included here because it's assumed that religion is something inherited through the families. The language, for instance, that you speak, the sectarian tendencies, whatever your sect you're belonging to. So that discrimination is happening either because of the features that you bring by birth, the color of your skin or whatever, or on ideological basis. When a common discrimination starts in a society, it happens because people belong to certain ideological groups, like all Marxists, let's say, all political Islamists, let's say, or because they're all Sunnis, Alawites, Shias, for instance, because they're Christians, Jews, Muslims, for instance, because they belong to certain clans, certain families, certain ethnic backgrounds, because they're Arabs, because they're Turkish people, because they're Kurdish people, because they're Persians, because they're Swahili, whatever. So, persecution on the basis of political, racial, religious grounds is once the society starts ill treatment against you because of the basis of that discrimination. Persecution, zulum. And what else? Enslavement, deportation, extermination, they're also elements of crimes against humanity. So any kind of crime that you can think of, as I told you, murder, ill behavior, torture, um, enslavement. In the principle seven, the committee of judges in Nuremberg trials have formulated that complicity in international crimes is also punishable. It also establishes the basis for individual criminal responsibility. Complicity is cooperation, collaboration. During the Holocaust, let's say, you're, a so you're not a soldier, you're a civilian. And the soldiers are in your district looking for Jewish people to collect and you give the address. You tell where they're hiding. This is complicity. And you cannot claim to be an innocent person after you cooperate, after you provide those policies with certain sources with knowledge, once you start supporting them, this is co uh, complicity then. And complicity also requires individual criminal responsibility because it is also indirectly taking part in huge violations of human rights. So, at the moment, we have, we don't have international military tribunals anymore, uh, Nuremberg military tribunals. Nuremberg tribunals are ad hoc courts. They were established only for the reason to prosecute the criminals of Holocaust, Second World War. Or Tokyo tribunals were specialized tribunals only for the Japanese soldiers that have committed those crimes against peace during Second World War. In 1990s, we have seen uh, the tribunal special on Rwanda. We have seen the special tribunal on um, Lebanon. We have witnessed the International Criminal Tribunal on the former Yugoslavia. And they are on all ad hoc courts. So they're temporary. They're established only for one single reason. And after that reason was fulfilled, they were closed down. And all of them, they needed certain legal sources for their jurisdiction. What they have done is preparing their own guidelines, 
like you have seen in the Nuremberg Principles. And each new tribunal have used the guidelines that was formerly prepared, plus they have added something on them. Those ad hoc formulations have resulted in 1998 for the formulation of the Rome Statute, the founding treaty of International Criminal uh, Court. The aim is altogether establishing individual criminal responsibility and ending impunity. So no one should remain unpunished, especially if they are the perpetrators of four core crimes. At the moment, we have one permanent court, International Criminal Court. That court is in which country? ICC? In Netherlands. In Den Haag, that's true. And that's a permanent court. So it is not shutting down after it fulfills one jurisdiction. That court is there in order to prosecute the leaders that commit those four core crimes. Have we ever seen a leader before ICC? One head of the state? The butcher. <laughs> Good. The butcher, who is... Do you remember his name? Good, yes. And he's known as the butcher. That's also correct. Who is that? Slobodan? Come on. Slobodan? Milosevic, that's true. The butcher Milos, as you have told. That's right. So Slobodan Milosevic is the first and only leader we have seen until today before the International Criminal Court. I guess I have his crimes in one of my slides. Let me see. Uh -huh. I have just collected the titles here. But if you find his file then, you'll see that there are the titles. And each of those titles are supported by numerous examples of his crimes. So let's take a closer look. He's indicted for genocide, first of all. What else? Complicity is genocide. Deportation. Murder. Persecution on political, racial or religious grounds. Inhuman acts and forcible transfer. I have shortened the names, by the way. Extermination, imprisonment, torture, willful killing, unlawful confinement, willfully causing great suffering, unlawful deportation or transfer. Have you ever been to Bosnia? Anyone who has been to Sarajevo, perhaps? In the city, you have been there. In the city, there's a tram. And, well, people used to take it because they had to reach their homes or work. The train is, for instance, known as the roulette tram. You have to get on that tram. You're standing or sitting somewhere. The thing is that from time to time, every second day, a sniper kills one person in that tram. You're on your way home and one of the persons will be killed. That's why it was known as roulette tram, for instance. And that's just one single example of what was happening in that territory. So the crimes are not simply simple murders that you can think of. They are inhumanly planned actions to harm people, to make them suffer, to make them leave the country to make them remain completely weak, to make them humiliated. Cruel treatment, plunder of public private property, attacks on civilians, destruction or willful damage done to historic monuments and institutions dedicated to education or religion. Once you start reading about what all those titles actually mean, what kind of crimes were actually committed, you'll be completely shocked. 
And, well, those are the charges of Milosevic. Perhaps last year, I guess you have seen that in the news. There was, again, a Serbian commander before ICC. And he is very famous because he is the person behind distracting the Mostar Bridge. And his list is also quite crowded as here, his crimes list. He was listening to the judge. Just, ju uh, the judge was telling him what his crimes are. Have you seen that scene? Do you remember it? So, uh, no, I'm innocent. I haven't done anything. There was a shot glass before him. He took it, drank it, and died. So he poisoned himself. And it's on YouTube to see. So ICC has overtaken um, what ICTY was doing. It is collecting those leaders, perpetrators of core crimes before judges, giving them the opportunity to express themselves, a fair trial takes place. And at the end, if that person had not poisoned himself, if he had not committed suicide, did anyone read what his punishment would be? He was already in prison since a long time. If he had listened everything to the very end, he was to be punished with eight months. Well, um, so those courts are calling the leaders. Well, it, that's not something we often see. That's why I'm giving those examples of Milosevic and that commander that I've forgotten his name. But uh, what I mean is that that's what the court is established for. It is dealing with international crimes and individuals. And individual criminal responsibilities are established. And uh, prosecutions are done on the basis that are first formulated through Nuremberg uh, principles, through the um, status of ICTY, and many other UN treaties, like Genocide Convention of 48, for instance. So there are numerous UN treaties that also set the base of jurisdiction of ICC, and all of them have set the basis of the Rome Statute 98. That is what ICC is established for. For most of the time, what I see is that students confuse ICC with ICJ. You confuse their names in the exam, what you mean is ICC, but you write ICJ. They're completely two different things. Their work is completely different, and their sources are completely different. So what are those differences? The first thing you have learned was about International Court of Justice. International Court of Justice, we have said that it is one of the six main organs of the United Nations. So ICJ is a UN branch. ICC is not a UN branch. So it's completely independent. An independent court, an international court, it's an international organization on its own. All organizations have their own founding treaties. The founding treaty of ICC is the Rome Statute. The founding treaty of ICJ is the Statute of ICJ. ICC, the criminal court, is a penal court. It is sanctifying, it's penalizing the criminals. And it deals with individuals, criminal individuals. ICJ never deals with individuals. It deals with states or with the organizations, international organizations, but not with uh, individuals. And it is not a panel court, uh, court actually. It's not implementing sanctions. Um, ICJ is dealing with the disputes related to international law, like border disputes how to decide upon the sovereignty of a certain territory, or how to interpret international law. It is either giving advisory opinions, so we are, let's say, 48 nations, and we have decided to establish a new international organization, and we have formulated our own treaty. 
but we are not sure if this treaty is okay with international law or if we're somehow contradicting. Then we can ask for the advisory opinion of ICJ. What else? When the states cannot solve their own problems on their own, then they're allowed to refer their cases to ICJ. So two states cannot solve what's happening in between. If both of them shows consent to carry the issue to ICJ, then ICJ is also there in order to see that conflict if the consent of both states are there. Then it gives a decision. Normally, if I'm mad at someone, if I want to sue you, then I go to the state prosecutor and I write a petition about my claims, about my complaint, and then the court calls you. This is not the case for ICJ. For ICJ, both of the sides have to agree to bring their case to ICJ. So it deals with the states, the conflicts in between states or international organizations. So this is known as contentious cases. It deals with either contentious cases in between states or it deals with, it gives advisory opinions. It's not punishing anyone. ICC is a panel court. It is implementing sanctions on individuals, on criminal individuals, and the basis of their prosecution, of their, uh, of their uh, jurisdiction, is the four core crimes. The leader of your state can still be a criminal that deals with money laundry. Does ICC take care of that leader? Definitely not, no. ICC takes care of those leaders that have conducted one of those four core crimes. And what else? Because ICC is giving decisions, its decisions can also be referred to the Court of Appeals. So the decision can be appealed. Here there is no need for appealing because they don't give such decisions. And because ICJ, let me finish, then I'll collect the questions. Uh, the ICJ is a branch of UN. This means the monetary uh, fund is provided by the UN itself. ICC is an independent international organization. So it has its own sources through its member states plus voluntary donations of other organizations of other states. So this is the comparison of those two courts. I hope you'll be confident about both of the courts. I guess I can collect the questions at the moment before I either proceed or stop. Uh, the first question was yours. Let me. Okay, imagine Germany, German leaders have decided to capture Jews. This is their national idea. And ICC is saying that this is a crime. Whoever formulates such policies, they will be prosecuted. It sounds as if it's a move against sovereignty, but there are certain principles in international law. You're right, sovereignty is one of them. Human rights is another one. And the state is responsible for both of them. If the state is failing to protect one of them, then the state is not functioning well. Yes, sovereignty is something that the state has to capture well. Plus, the state must also respect human rights in its own countries. This is also one of use Kogan's principle. Do you remember we have mentioned that in the very beginning during the uh, law of treaties, for instance, 
all kinds of treaties can be done in between the states. States are sovereign and they decide upon their uh, formulations of treaties, but the limit is human rights again. So human rights is one of the basic principles beside uh, sovereignty. All right. The second hand was yours, yes. Yeah, I was going to ask about one of the uh, main columns of the, of the law. Like it, the, the, the law rules does not go back. So if something is not uh, prescripted in the past, like you cannot prosecute it in the future. But as far as I know, international law kind of like puts a wall into it and check, like, uh, like do you think that is fair? At least like maybe it is. not 40 and 19. What we're talking about here, not a whole country, individuals. And Hindu, individual lifespan is already, we know, at, I mean, it can stretch to 100, perhaps, but that's it. And what we know is that if the person has already given huge harms, I tell you, we're not talking about human trafficking and so on. What we're talking about here are grave violations of human rights. And if such violations are never stopped and penalized, then humanity takes a new U-turn, which cannot be taken back. This would be then the basis for global wars. And therefore, this has to be some, something that has to be prevented. Human rights must be protected and upheld. And wherever there is a gap related to protection of human rights, that gap has to be filled as soon as possible. Because the philosophical idea behind human rights is so huge. One person's honor is the honor of the entire mankind. Do you have something to yeah, add? Let's say uh, the country punished the person. Like uh, they gave some order, but the person didn't do it and killed like thousands of people. And the A genocide has happened, you yeah, mean? And, and country executed the prosecutor. And still this country is the country executed their own leader, so the national system has functioned well then. There is no problem at that point. This can happen. Murat had a question, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. No, you don't. Okay. Um, maybe one like, last question mm -hmm. that's related to that topic. Like, mm -hmm. In some countries, such as like Russia, and maybe Turkey is included as well, uh, the, the level of the toleration towards violence is kind of high. And these countries' governments have really like authoritarian systems. Whenever you become a part of the government, mm -hmm. like, they literally say, we own you. And you have to do whatever they say. Like, it's not about your choices. You can't just say, oh, I'm not following your orders because of this. Like, they're not going to listen to that. Like, they put pressure. They even threaten your family, your whole life. And these kind of situations, people mm -hmm. usually make this into like, it's me or them. Like, it's about survival. In this kind of situations, like, is it really fair to blame people this kind of you know what? It has to put pressure on you. You have to follow the orders. You have to know one thing. You can't remain innocent under such conditions. You either are going to choose a harder life by escaping, but picking the side of human rights and higher values, or you just want to protect yourself, you don't care about the rest of the humanity, then this is your personal choice. One thing you have to keep in mind, you are not remaining innocent anymore. You cannot relax your conscience with that. You have to carry the individual liability of your uh, crime. So by knowing this, choose your side. The laws are telling you this is fair. You are definitely right, but usually uh, the winner, of course, like the winner has the Mm -hmm. like winner decides and this person cannot know authoritarian regimes before authoritarian regimes you remain weak as an individual that's what you were saying but if you clear the conscience of those people following the following is always easier making yourself smaller is always easier because it's your comfort zone you know but still this is establishing also some philosophical uh, values that you pick, you know what you are following. It is not making the work or the entire business easier for authoritarian states. Is there any reduction of the uh, punishment in this kind of situations? 
it is a crime. What following the orders? If the orders are to um, to violate human rights, is a crime. Nothing. No deduction. Nothing. No, I mean like one person can do it like willingly. The commander told you either I'm going to shoot you or you're going to do this. Then, then you are picking uh, the option to live further, but you have to keep something in mind. You become a criminal. Either you die innocently or you continue killing, but you become a criminal. Then you have to pick your side. This is left to the individual. Uh, you had a question or? I don't get your question. Once again? The penalty was given by ICC. Mm -hmm. One person refused to... Sorry. The person can use the appeals court. You get a decision from the uh, court. I get and, it. Mm -hmm. National court system. So the police can take you out. No. No. International laws override the national laws under criminal law. Uh, so no, it cannot be. Uh huh. Then someone has to fetch you and give you back to the prison of International Criminal Court. And yeah, that someone is either one of the party members of the Rome Statute. Those signatory member states are in charge of that. Plus, if the Security Council uh, passes a resolution related to fetching this guy, be a party or not, to Rome Statute, you are responsible to fetch this guy, then all other states are also liable to give you back to the court if you escape. And I have seen some other hands, yes. Hocam, uh, we said ICC won't look at uh, transnational crimes, but uh, we said universal jurisdiction uh, looks both at both, both of these crimes. So uh, which court uh, that, uh, looks at transnational crimes? We'll come back to that later in the course. I don't want to confuse anyone at this point. Okay. okay? Uh, ICC what you have to keep in mind is that International Criminal Court and all uh, other ad hoc courts are, what they're conducting is known as universal jurisdiction. And ICC is only dealing with this part of international crimes. Only that. There are also other versions of universal jurisdiction that also deal with transnational crimes, but I don't want to confuse you at this point. I just want you to learn about international criminal responsibility. Yes, please, then I'm coming to you. Yes. I have the same point with my friend. It's actually the Nuremberg principles, children sort of are against natural judge principle. These are all um, judges, I mean, they, they, they have expertise in law, so they, True. they might simply go out their principles on use against, as you said, because the um, crimes against uh, humanity is sort of use against all it or the part of a customary law. So they may say that, they might say that it's the codification of use against or the um, customary law. So don't they have this concern because what you're all the time confusing is that, generally, human rights is the highest value that we have. The state is telling you, either I'm going to conduct surveillance 24 hours a day, I'll know where you are, who you're talking to, and record, and I'm doing it for your security. Then people are like, that's fine then. The thing is that human rights they're always the highest value. And the state is there in order to provide you with both of those values, security and human rights. Human rights is not something that can be sacrificed for other principles, for other concerns. Human rights have always to be kept up. That's the highest thing that we have to have. If there is a gap in protection of human rights, and that gap, we learn about the gap after this is misused, of course, after certain unwanted things happen, we cannot say that, okay, we just ignored this time and we're going to formulate rules for that, which is going to be uh, in charge for the forthcoming. It's too late. Human rights are already violated and human uh, dignity is already violated. This cannot be ignored. Human 
dignity is the most important thing that we have. It has to be always protected, promoted. Therefore, at that point, you should always, I mean, there is a general tendency to compare things with human rights. Human rights is not something that can be compared with anything. It has to be held up. At the same time, other uh, concerns can also be held up. Human rights are important. Sovereignty is also important. But this doesn't mean that human rights can be violated on behalf of sovereignty. Impossible. Both of them have to be held up. All right. Uh, my point is that I definitely agree with you in the sense that human rights prevails over anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point is that this principle is also part of human rights because the uh, prosecution of a criminal, as you saw, uh, showed us, is a part of human rights. Their rights. So mm -hmm. it's citing putting the whole to this chamber also because the judges should think that in the future there may be some. A uh, complicated case, controversial case, that the uh, criminals should be prosecuted according to the uh, principle that existed before, and this puts a hole in this chamber, I mean, human rights chamber. That can be somehow abused, do you believe? Yes. Well, imagine, I mean, Tokyo principles, they are formulated because Japan was de defeated. Nuremberg principles, they are formulated because Germany was defeated. So then you can say that there's still a loophole at that point. Yeah. They were defeated. What if they were not defeated? What if Holocaust, well, it was fine, it was done, and Germany was not defeated? Then could we speak about Nuremberg principles? Probably not. Then does this make Holocaust uh, justifiable? Then I mean, there are some contradictions because there's a huge philosophical background behind laws, which includes ethics. And religions, for instance, they also somehow contradict with them. Which one prevails? Which one then is a huge concern for certain territories? So yes, philosophical questions remain, you're right, but this is how the implementation is at this point, and this is how the equation is uh, continued. I have to continue with your friend. Yes? Yeah, I think what you say, you said, I think Jake doesn't mean appeal. What do you mean by Do you know what appeal courts do? Okay, appealing is that, first of all, you go to a court and the court makes a decision and you're not happy with the decision. Then you bring this decision to a higher court. Okay, this is what I mean. Yes, no. Yes, this is why the consent of both sides are necessary. If both sides show consent, this means that we know that ICJ is going to make a decision and we're ready to adopt their solution because we are not able to find our own solution. So that's why they don't need an appeal. They already pre-accept the decision. That, I guess someone was, uh, I have seen one hand, did you? No, okay, then you. Mm -hmm. It has a higher chamber of judges. So it's in ICC itself. It's not a separate court. It's not a residual ANC. It's in it. Yes. So can we say that I could be international law court? Uh, there was no board uh, in the world last five years at least. So the last one was in Balkans. That's yeah, that's how it is. Yes. Any other questions? Could you follow everything related to International Criminal Court? How the court functions, what are the historical background are, the key concepts, why is it established, why it deals with individuals, contrary to the entire international law, how come ICC is different than ICJ, so you won't be writing anything wrong in the exam. I guess you're done well. Then I guess we can stop here. Yes, if you don't have any other questions.